Genomic technology. All right. So, step one, let's talk about um, some misnomers that we use. Uh, this term GMO, not really a scientific term. Um, GMO just refers to any organism that has uh, had its genome modified in some way. Okay, so we could modify it by breeding one species with another species. That would be a GMO, right? Uh, we could uh, do the same thing. We could, we could modify it by um, splicing one species with another or grafting on one part of a plant onto another part of a plant. Okay, for instance, um, very common process here in Florida. Um, we grow a lot of citrus in Florida, um, and you may see that there's like, you know, you could go to the, to, the, to the grocery store and you could buy like Florida orange juice, like that's a brand of orange juice. But you may be interested to know that um, the Florida orange is disgusting. It's the worst tasting orange you'd ever taste in your life. Um, it's really, really, really high in citric acid. It tastes more like a lemon than it does like an orange. And uh, so how do we make these delicious Florida oranges then? Well, we take the Florida orange tree that's really good at growing in Florida. Uh, it's really good at growing in Florida soil. It's really good at growing in Florida temperatures. Um, and then when it's a little baby, we graft on the good tasting fruit to it, right? And then it produces the good tasting fruit for the rest of its life. The interesting thing about that is that if you were to take a seed out of the good tasting fruit and plant it, it would produce a disgusting tasting Florida orange, right? So you can't take a you know, navel orange that you buy in the store and plant that seed and expect it to grow more navel oranges. It'll just grow Florida oranges that are disgusting. Um, does, that, does that sound dangerous to anybody grafting on a delicious tasting fruit to a a tree that grows well in Florida? No, right? That's That doesn't sound weird. In fact, something that we've done for ages. We've done that basically since the advent of agriculture. Occasionally, we'll take a fruit that we like or a plant that we like the way that it tastes, uh, but maybe it grows slowly, and then we'll take another plant that um, doesn't produce as good of tasting fruit or crop, and uh, maybe it grows fast, and we'll try to breed them together. And sometimes we get a fast growing, good tasting plant, and sometimes we get a, a slow growing, bad tasting plant, and we just throw the bad one out, right? And we, we, we breed the good one. That's how we do agriculture. It's how we've done agriculture for a long period of time. Uh, the only thing that's different now so we're getting a little better at it. Instead of um, splicing together two whole plants because one grows fast, we just say, hey, there's a couple of genes in there that are making it grow fast. Let's just take those genes out and put them in this other plant that we like the way that it tastes. We're just better at it, right? So um, we call these transgenic organisms. And a transgenic organism is any organism that has a gene in it that um, is from another organism, a different organism. Any organism um, that has a gene that has been transplanted from another organism. Okay, and um, not all the transgenic organisms that we have are necessarily considered GMOs, like we normally talk about GMOs. Generally, when we talk about GMOs, we're talking about things that we eat, right? So GMO, genetically modified organism, is a, a non-scientific term to talk about uh, transgenic organisms that we eat. to consume, right? So uh, examples of GMOs, um, there's really two different things that we uh, would do to a GMO crop. Um, the first thing that we might do is um, add some genes for resistance, right? Resistance genes. Okay, these genes for resistance, they would resist things like um, insects, like, um, herbicides,
okay? Those are things that we might want plants to be resistant to. We might want them to be resistant to, you know, some kind of beetle that normally eats that plant, right? And if they produce a chemical or something like that that stops that beetle from eating them, that would be good, okay? Um, herbicides, we want to be able to spray herbicides on our crops to kill all the other plants around um, so that it doesn't kill the, the crop plant. Uh, this allows us to grow plants um, in a smaller amount of space and um, get a higher yield from them. And uh, that's in entirely important. It's incredibly important right now because there are 7.15 billion people on Earth, and uh, that's a lot of people. That's way more people than Earth should be able to support, um, and the only reason that it can support that much is because we've got a lot of technology that allows us to grow uh, a large amount of, f of food in a small amount of space, right? If we didn't do that, people would die. If everybody on Earth was like, no, forget GMOs, forget uh, the Haber process. We're just going to grow everything all natural, right? Uh, yeah, so I'm not talking about like 100,000 people die. I'm talking about like a couple billion people die of starvation, right? So we can't do that. We can't just say natural is the only way to go because everybody dies then. Uh, and, and I'm not saying like everybody dies in the case of everybody will die of starvation. I'm talking about lots of people start dying of starvation and the rest of people will die of war over the starvation and the food. Right? So, GMOs are really good. They're important for keeping us alive and stopping all hell from breaking loose on Earth. Right? Um, the other thing that we might code for in the GMOs uh, are growth factors. Growth factor genes are ones that, just like they sound like, will make um, organisms grow faster. And so uh, organisms that grow faster will be able to produce a larger yield in a smaller amount of time and therefore feed more people for less cost. And so that turns out to be important as we get more and more people on Earth. Um, everybody pretty much guarantees or pretty much um, uh, agrees that Earth is past its carrying capacity. Uh, for humans, that, that we shouldn't have this many people on Earth, and so the only way to continue to have this many people, as I said, is to continue to grow our technology, continue to, to do better at making crops more efficiently. Um, there's also transgenic organisms that we don't eat, though, right, uh, that are used for medical uh, purposes, so medical transgenic organisms. And uh, a good example of this is uh, something like E. coli, right? These are organisms that um, produce important medicines. Due to gene insertion. Okay. So a really good example of this, like I said, is E. coli, right? Shrikia coli. It's a, it's a gut bacteria. Uh, it's really common. And um, one of the things that we use uh, E. coli for right now is for the production of insulin, right? Um, there are people who have diabetes and a specific type of diabetes called type 1 mm. diabetes is the type where um, you're born with an autoimmune disorder that stops your pancreas from being able to produce insulin and your body cells will still respond normally to insulin like they should, um, but your body just can't produce it. And so they rely on insulin injections in order to be able to control their blood sugar, right? The way that we used to get insulin was um, we would take pigs, we would um, uh, raise these pigs, and when we raised them, we would basically just feed them nothing but sugar. We'd feed them like sugar water and um, corn with sugar on it and various very high sugar substances. And uh, basically we give the, the pigs diabetes and um, it's not type one diabetes, it's type two diabetes, which is insulin resistance diabetes, which basically means that your pancreas produces a ton of insulin, so much so that your body doesn't care about it and uh, stops paying attention to the insulin. Um, these pigs then, very unhealthy diabetic pigs are producing a bunch of insulin. We would then extract the insulin from their pancreas and spin it down in a centrifuge to make sure that it didn't have any impurities or other things in it. And then um, we send that out to, to the pharmacies. Very expensive to do it this way. The pigs died a lot because they were super unhealthy. Uh, it's not cheap to raise pigs in the first place. Pigs are also very intelligent, so there were some cruelty issues. Uh, 
you know, pretty much just bad. Uh, but we can take E. coli and we can make them do the same thing. E. coli now produces all of our insulin. Uh, e. coli production of insulin. And the way that we do that is um, by inserting a gene into it. And uh, we can't just insert the gene for human uh, insulin into E. coli because the gene for human insulin has entrons and exons uh, and they gotta be spliced together and stuff like that because we're eukaryotes. And so the first step actually is to create a correct gene that could be expressed by E. coli. And the way that you do that is you start out with the mRNA, the already processed mRNA. It's already been spliced up, it's got its G-cap and its poly A tail stuff or uh, poly A tail stuff on it already. Uh, and uh, so that stuff is the mRNA and we get it from the cytoplasm because at that point it's already been exported uh, from the nucleus. So mRNA is isolated from a eukaryotic cell, specifically a human cell at this point. Okay, then they have to create DNA using the mRNA. So they're gonna use um, a process that's called reverse transcription. We're going to take an enzyme out of uh, a virus in order to do this called reverse transcriptase. And we create something called cDNA. cDNA is complementary DNA. Basically, you just take the mRNA and you make its complement in cDNA, right? Uh, and we say cDNA is created using the mRNA template. And then you just insert that cDNA into the bacteria using some sort of a vector, some sort of a transplant mechanism. Okay, so cDNA is inserted into bacteria using a gene vector. And we say gene vector, that just means some method of inserting genes two major common ways of doing this. You can use a bacterial plasmid, which are those rings of DNA that bacteria would normally share uh, to share things like antibiotic resistance and stuff like that. But if you insert this cDNA into a plasmid, uh, bacteria are very likely to take it in and then share it with each other and, and start making that insulin. And the other thing that um, they can do uh, that's becoming more common is to use a virus, a, a genetically modified virus, in order to infect the bacterial cells with this DNA that we want them to express. Okay, so viruses can be pretty good vectors for um, inserting genes. Um, overall, this process creates a bacteria, creates an E. coli bacteria that just goes through and it transcribes that gene for, uh, for uh, insulin. And then once it does that, it just starts producing a bunch of insulin protein and then we just extract it from these large colonies of bacteria that we're growing. No harm to pigs. Everything is done in a very small space in a laboratory. We can get a lot of insulin in a little amount of time. And so the result of that was uh, the price of insulin going basically to the floor. And it's so, so cheap now to buy insulin, which is great for people who have type 1 diabetes, um, because now they are not crippled by their disease. So GMOs, good. Um, now let's talk about some, some bad stuff about GMOs. There's nobody, no study has ever been done that said that a GMO crop will give you cancer or anything like that. Uh, we've talked about the studies that have been done. There was uh, one mentioned on there. A lot of them were just garbage. They, they were poorly done studies with low sample sizes, uh, lots of problems, cherry picked data, things like that. We've been eating GMOs for a really long time and there's no evidence to say that they have caused any uh, Ill, Ill health effects. Um, however, there's lots of arguments against GMOs still, okay? First of all, we are creating superior species, right? That is going to lower biodiversity. If those superior species get out of the farm, they will take over, right? A very good example of this is the canola plant. We grow canola plant to make canola oil, right? And um, one of the things that happened was its uh, seed got distributed by wind, as seeds do, uh, and then now all over the mid, Western United States, there's these giant um, patches of yellow flowers that are canola flowers that are GMO canola that have taken over all the wild grasses that should be growing there because they're just better. We made them better by GMOing them, right? Uh, or by GMing them. Um, the other example of this is with that Roundup stuff, right? So if you make a crop resistant to Roundup, right, that's not 
that bad, you can still eat that crop and that protein that's resistant to the Roundup is not going to hurt you. The thing that hurts you is the fact that they're spraying you with tons of Roundup, right? Roundup is bad for you. Wash your fruits and vegetables before you eat them. That's a big deal, right? Even if you're eating organic, you should wash your fruits and vegetables before you eat them. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the documentaries on how these uh, crops are often picked. Uh, a lot of times they use migrant farm workers that are not even supplied with bathrooms. So they just go to the bathroom in the fields where your food is being picked, right? So there's obviously bad stuff on your fruit, even if it's not chemically bad. And chemicals, is, that's a terrible word to use because it doesn't mean anything. But wash your fruits off. That's just like a thing. You always do that, no matter what, right? It doesn't matter if it's a GMO fruit or not. You should just wash it. Um, anyways, I'm not going to stand on my high horse or up on my soapbox any, any longer. Um, but I do want to look back at this really quick here so you can see the fruits of our labor here, our, our um, gel electrophoresis. Okay, you can see that uh, it has moved quite a bit through the gel here. Let's back up a little bit. You can see that, that it's totally separated. You can start to see that this is now resembling that um, gel that I passed around um, where they have all separated based on um, their, uh, based on their um, charge and the size, okay? Um, obviously, they're not, not nice bands here because I ran this over the course of 30 minutes rather than the course of 24 hours or something like that. The longer you run the gel at the lower voltage, the better the separation you'll see. Otherwise, you get something that's sort of cloudy and boomerangy like this one. Questions on that? All right, that's it.